they're, they're embedded in belief systems. And what I look at is I see all the belief systems, and when you line them up, they're not really compatible with one another. So whatever they're believing, it can't be a truth that applies to everybody because other people believe what they do with no less fervor. And so I sit back and as a person who's interested in, ob in objective truths and I say, well, it doesn't look like that's a path towards an objective truth. So let people continue to think and say what they want. But as a citizen of a country that is not founded on a, on a, on a, on a religion, it's founded with, with sort of a secular construct in a way that protects whatever religion you want to express. This is protected in the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't actually mention God. Right. R rather controversial in its day. And the, the, it doesn't mention God because they don't want legislation to tell you what God to worship. They knew this. They knew how governments can persecute people who had belief systems that didn't agree with the state. They knew this. So they created those freedoms. And so we have these freedoms. Go ahead. But if you're going to create legislation that has to apply to everybody, and you're now going to put your belief system into legislation, that is not a free and open democracy. An incredible flash of energy and light, though. And matter, and yeah, all of this, all of the above. Do you give people who make this case that that was the beginning and that there had to be something that provoke the beginning? Do you give them an A at least for trying to reconcile faith and reason? Um, I don't think they're reconcilable. What do you mean? Well, well, so let me say that differently. All efforts that have been invested by brilliant people of the past have failed at that exercise. They just fail. And so I don't, I, I don't, the track record is so poor that Going forward, I have essentially zero confidence, near zero confidence, that there will be fruitful things to emerge from the effort to reconcile them. So, for example, if you, if you knew nothing about science and you read, say, the Bible, the Old Testament, which in Genesis is an account of nature, that's, that's what that is, and I said to you, give me your description of the natural world based only on this. You would say the world was created in six days and that stars are just little points of light, much lesser than the sun. And in fact, they can fall out of the sky, right? Because that's what happens during, during the um, revelation. One of the signs that yeah. the second coming is that the stars will fall out of the sky and land on earth. So to even write that means you don't know what those things are. You have no concept of what the actual universe is. So everybody who tried to make proclamations about the physical universe based on Bible passages got the wrong answer. So what happened was when science discovers things and you want to stay religious or you want to continue to believe that the Bible is, is unerring, what you would do is you would say, well, let me go back to the Bible and reinterpret it. Then you say things like, oh, they didn't really mean that literally, they meant that figuratively. So this whole sort of reinterpretation of the fig how figurative the poetic passages of the Bible are came after science showed that this is not how things unfolded. And so the educated religious people are perfectly fine with that. It's the fundamentalists who want to say that the Bible is the literally literal truth of God that and want to see the Bible as a science textbook who are knocking on the science doors of the schools trying to put that content in the science. Uh, enlightened religious people are not behaving that way. They're saying, yes, yeah, science is cool, we're good with that, and use the Bible for, to get your spiritual enlightenment and your emotional fulfillment. Tablet in the sky that said it had to be simple to end up being complex, and it's a remarkable fact about the universe. So why not celebrate it? The fact that pi, pi, that, that pi, pi, right? Let's, let's say the numbers together. 3.14.
with you, man. That's, 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 that's a nerd fact. That's what we got a geek thing going on over there. It's not bad. Like. Not bad. The fact that you take a circle of any size, a circle the size of the universe itself, and divide it by its own radius, and you get that number, that's beautiful. I have to pause, and I, I get misty thinking of that. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's, that's just that, another one, another one, that the atoms and molecules in your body are traceable to the crucibles in the centers of stars that manufactured these elements over its lifespan, went unstable on death, exploding its enriched guts across the galaxy, scattering it into gas clouds that would ultimately collapse and make a star and have the right ingredients to make planets and people. Which means we are part of this universe. As I've said many times, and this is, goes back, the, the, not only are we in the universe, the universe is in us. That is a profound concept. And it was, I think it's the greatest gift that astrophysics gave culture in the 20th century. CERN, this is where they have the famous Large Hadron Collider. This is like, they're, they're, they're at the limits. It, it is the highest energy ever attained on Earth. Uh, and by the way, we would have done three times this energy had Congress not cut the funding for the superconducting super collider that would have been built in Texas. That was cut back in, in the early 90s, right around just after peace broke out in Europe, by the way. Physicists are only really useful when we're at war, according to government funding patterns. So they're looking for the Higgs boson and, uh, and anything else that shows up on the docket. Higgs boson is a particle that gives mass to other particles. So it's kind of cool. Some people have called it the God particle, and including physicists. What are they doing over in China? Well, they're building the largest dam in the world, the Three Gorges Dam, and they have a burgeoning aerospace industry growing at 14% a year, 13% a year. Their economy is growing at 10% a year. By the way, what's your interest rate you're getting on your savings account in your bank? Okay. <laughs> Did you get that over here? These get Well, if you go to this other bank, you get 0.005, you know? Yeah, so other countries, different things are happening. Do you know that in Russia, they want to actually send a mission to deflect the POFIS? They actually are prepared to fund that. That picture that I drew and did my little dance, that's not funded. That's just ideas on a page. Russia actually wants to fund it. And they invited us to participate. And I said, well, sure. But then I thought about it. I was asked by the NewsHour, what are my top 10 news stories of the year? This was now end of 2009. What are my top 10? I said, I don't have 10 stories. I have five. OK, what are they? I said, one of them is Russia inviting us to join them to deflect Apophis. They said, why? I said, Here's why. <laughs> why is Russia creating the spaceship that's going to deflect Apophis, which, if it hits, wipes out the west coast of the United States? Aren't we the ones who are supposed to fund that mission and then invite others to participate? Isn't this how it has always been before? So that was an important news story for me because that is the beginning of the end. That's where you think you're at the top and people start doing things on their own with or without you. And all of a sudden, you, not all of a sudden, you gradually fade to insignificance on the world stage. That was writing on the wall for me when we were not leading that mission. Let's keep going. How about Brazil? If I mention Brazil, what's the first thing you think of? Someone said, bikinis. bikinis. <laughs> the guys are saying, yeah, the tong bikinis, yeah. Uh, soccer, maybe? OK. This is the American view of Brazil. I understand. It's completely understandable. However, it blinds you to the fact that they have a burgeoning aerospace industry. Do you know that most planes that you fly between regional cities is made and designed in Brazil? You're not thinking this because you're still distracted by bikinis. 
Brazil has the third largest aerospace industry in the world, employing 18,000 people. It's a $20 billion industry there, and they invented the first airplane that can fly on alcohol. Brazil. Now, we don't do that because we just drink our alcohol. See, see, that's how that happens. We don't even think to make a plane out of it. So just notice the American bias that prevents us from recognizing the rest of the world rising up as we stand there flat-footed. The history of discovery, particularly cosmic discovery, but discovery in general, scientific discovery, is one where at any given moment there's a frontier. And there tends to be an urge for people, especially religious people, to assert that across that boundary into the unknown lies the handiwork of God. This shows up a lot. Newton even said it. He had his laws of gravity and motion, and he was explaining the moon and the planet. He was there. He doesn't mention God for any of that. And then he gets to the limits of what his equations can calculate. So I don't can't quite figure this out. Maybe God steps in and makes it right every now and then. That's, that's where he invoked God. And, the, and Ptolemy, he, 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 he bet on the wrong horse, but he was a brilliant guy. He formulated the geocentric universe with Earth in the middle. This is where we got epicycles and all these, all this machinations of the heavens. There was still a mystery to him. He, he looked up and uttered the following words. I, when I trace at my pleasure the windings to and fro of the heavenly bodies, these are the planets going through retrograde and back, the mysteries of the earth. When I trace at my pleasure the windings to and fro of the heavenly bodies, I no longer touch earth with my feet. I stand in the presence of Zeus himself and take my fill of ambrosia. What he did was invoke, he didn't invoke Zeus to account for the rock, that he's standing on or the air he's breathing. It was this point of mystery. And in gets invoked God. This, over time, has been described by philosophers as the God of the gaps. If, if that's how you, if that's where you're going to put your God in this world, then God is an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance. If that's how you're going to invoke God, if God is the mystery of the universe, these mysteries, we're, we're tackling these mysteries one by one. If you're going to stay religious at the end of the conversation, God has to be more to you than just where science has yet to tread. So to the person who says, maybe dark matter is God, if the only reason why you're saying it's because it's a mystery, then get ready to have that undone. 1920s which was a watershed decade in the history of science. In that decade, we discovered that not only our galaxy, the Milky Way, is not the only existence of anything in the universe, that there are other Milky Ways out there. That recently? 1920s. Did, was it just the op optics didn't exist for that? We needed a big enough telescope, and Edwin Hubble wielded all the glass that necessary to accomplish that back in the 1920s. He said, Hubble before the telescope was a man and, <laughs> and had his own telescope, the biggest of its day, and he made that discovery that there were these spiral fuzzy things in the night sky. We thought they were just local to us. There are whole other systems of stars, 100 billion stars unto itself outside of our system. Not only was that discovered in 1926, 1929 he discovers that the universe is expanding which means it may have had a big, back then, it may have had a beginning. If it's expanded, that meant it was littler in the past. Well, there must have been a day when it was all together in the same place. Thus was born the Big Bang. Okay, so now, also in that decade, quantum, quantum mechanics, quantum physics was discovered. That is the science of the small, the science of electrons, protons, neutrons, particles, nuclei. At the time, you'd say, this is just the... This is just physicists burning tax money. Because who cares about the atom? I got my horse to feed. I got kids. I got, you know, you got issues in society. Yet it's quantum mechanics that is the entire foundation of our technological revolution. 
There would be no computers. There would be no, there would be none of what you take for granted, your iPod, your iPhone, cell phones, the space program, without our understanding of the laws of physics as they operate on that atomic and molecular and nuclear level. And so the, the, the chemist has no understanding of the periodic table of elements without quantum mechanics. To them, it's just a list of elements. Quantum mechanics tells you why this column is there, and that's there, why this mates with that, and why that makes a molecule with that. That's quantum mechanics, and it's unheralded. You ask me if there's any discovery that has changed how we live, it is quantum mechanics. And I make, I make this point because I'm ready to, Today, you hear people saying, why are we spending money up there when we've we got problems on Earth? And, we, and people don't connect. The time delay between the frontier of scientific research and how that's going to transform your life later down the line. So they, all they want is a quarterly report that shows the product that comes out of it. That is so short-sighted that that's the beginning of the end of your culture.